our efforts to address some of that. Uh, I think uh, it, it's still, uh, the, so I guess the, the, the statistics and the data year on year are showing that the um, progress is, is still um, relatively slow. And um, as you'll see from the statistics, it, it's uh, you know way behind what um, the, 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 the demographic is in England. So the Leaderboard Academy is about trying to uh, tackle that underrepresentation. It's very much um, uh, a positive action program and in partnership with the University of Leicester, where we, we get um, individuals um, from the BAME community, from all walks of life, be it from the sports sector, from the private sector, from the public sector. But one, one of the key criteria for, for getting onto the program is, uh, is having a passion for um, equality in sport and um and what, what the, the program itself is very much around supporting individuals to um to, to to become board ready so when there's a vacancy out there in the, in the in the sports sector in the in the within the boardrooms we um provide classroom based learning seminars recruitment cv support so you may think that sounds pretty similar like uh, your other lead, lead, leadership programs or board uh, programs but uh, what we uh, think is unique about this program is that all the the, the master classes the the wraparound support is all about um, the lived experience of of individuals who've been on the journey and they're sharing that and and then we're, what we're hoping is through the program where when um, the, the the academy members uh, are, are do uh, do hopefully join the boardrooms they're there and they're able and confident enough to to challenge what's happening because uh you know it was all about the nuances of being involved in a board and the master classes were you had individuals who said you know actually i went into the boardroom and i was the only person from a vain background and that for some can be unnerving not for all but it can be but uh, it's about recognizing and 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 what what we try to do the, the those key speakers and the master classes come from that lived experience and that's what we're finding is the individuals on the program can relate to they see people like us and they actually feel a bit more inspired to 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 see that journey through so the, the leaderboard uh, Pro academy program we've, we've run two cohorts and uh, you know over a third of the graduates have, have joined a sports board within six months uh, which is which is good news but we want to keep um keep uh, on that um, again uh, interestingly we've just had conversations with the university of leicester who are fully behind the program and uh uh, we're looking at the next cohort, which we may be looking at uh, a digital session. But uh, uh, as I say, it, it's very much a, a positive action program trying to address um, um, di the diversity within the sports sports rooms. And you may have heard uh, in um, you know the, the rumblings of the reiteration of the next sports code for governance, and um, it's something that we as an organisation have. Uh, lobbied on and and really saying well you know now is the time to introduce uh, um, uh, rigid targets around this as well so uh, so uh, you know I'm sure you'll hear more more about this over over the next coming months as well thanks uh, next slide please um, the BASPA advisory board um, BASPA short uh, acronym for British Asians in sport and physical activity. It's um, again the key point for us here was about following uh, the research and the insight. Set this up um, a, based on a seminar two years ago, and then the actually actual advisory board got set up uh, just over uh, just over a year ago. And this again is about following the insight um, around um, British Asians and the four key areas of talent in activity, coaching, and workforce. There was uh, insight in all those th those themes, uh, which was telling us about the uh, specific um, underrepresentation, um, and and what 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 um, we've we've done is they really get 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 together again. The key theme here is about people's um, lived experience. The, uh, these are individuals who've been involved in their in, in either professional or voluntary capacity. He, um, in those themes of talent and activity, coaching, workforce, and bringing all that knowledge, expertise, ex lived experience, and and putting together um, a, a manifesto and an, an action plan that sits underneath that to try to um, tackle 
tackle underrepresentation in, in all those areas. And I, and I think if this is about, um, you know, getting across to um, uh, sports providers, policy makers that, you know, there is not a one size fits all when it comes to tackling uh, racial, equality, uh, racial inequality. And it's about, um, you know, following following the insight and and basing interventions on, on and I'll keep coming back to that, the lived experience of individuals. So this board is made up of um, a number. Abu, who you, you will hear from later, uh, later is, is part of that group as well. And we're grateful for all his um, uh, support on that as well. Thank you. I guess we, we wanted to bring things a bit more uh, to life as well. Um, I wanted to share this case study in Kirklees. Um, it was about um, basically around um, increasing participation in, in, in swimming and, and, you know, put, you know, made it real. It was about a pool in Kirklees, uh, in, at the Batley Baths where it, you know, there were, there was actual, you know, dead pool time. There were times when that pool was just not being used and you had a, a large, large, um, South Asian community, a, a, a number of faith centers uh, dotted around. And it was about how can a facility bang in the heart of a, a, a of a, of a, um, big, big um, South Asian population. And, you know, and there was, it, you know, the research inside was telling us people from those communities didn't even know when, you know, in terms of uh, when the pool was available, when wasn't. Uh, and, but what we, what we worked with the, um, with Swim England and, um, and also the local communities was to really find out, find out actually about the appetite, what, what 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 types of programs should be put on there and and what, what rather than, rather than just uh, you know again a blanket blanket approach of um, the pools here everyone's welcome and saying you know uh, uh, this is for all it was very a targeted initiative there was there's some outreach work that went out where individuals um, uh, where where our activators went out into those community centres faith centres and talked to them did the um, um, uh, I guess the the, the the brokering work introduced um, the sessions and, and it was actually about saying actually what the offer should be um, uh, and how it should be marketed to those communities. And sometimes word of mouth is just as important as developing lots of marketing collateral as well. So um, again, the key point for that was the best thing, best advice we could give is around um, where you have facilities and where you have programs consult and talk to the communities who, who, who you're trying to um, engage as well and, and helping them shape it is important. It was quite interesting that um, uh, the start time was then also spent in terms of getting and encouraging some of those local community members to take their um, swim, le uh, swim leading courses and swim tutor courses and, and they became the advocates. And so again, the, the, the idea was to get local people um, involved in 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 rolling out this program as well so we know we certainly had an uptake in 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 uh, participation of that pull and you started actually getting um getting people from the community to be the advocates thank you i'll uh, pass you on to emily now hello again everyone um so what we've found over this period and by that I mean lockdown onwards, is a lot of the community organisations that we work with are in areas that have been drastically impacted. Of course, a lot of us have been drastically impacted, but as was made blatantly aware from the PHE report that was released back in May, Bain communities have been vastly affected by COVID, far more so than their white counterparts. I know it was briefly touched upon earlier that people from the Bangladeshi community were twice as likely to die. But then, of course, from other ethnic groups, from minority groups, that was anything from between 10 to 50 percent of a higher risk of dying. Um, we also found that that wasn't just the case of dying. It was a case of also becoming infected, um, overrepresentation on wards in hospitals, overrepresentation in ICU units. Um, but as we know, comorbidities play a big part in how badly an individual is affected by COVID-19 and we've been aware of this for years um, in terms of the links between physical activity and 
the health. So, for example, type 2 diabetes, that's vastly overrepresented represented in South Asian communities, um, cardiovascular disease and also high blood pressure. They are also overrepresented in bound communities. And the thing is with these comorbidities, which people had a greater risk of dying from COVID with, some of them are actually reversible or preventable from a healthy and active lifestyle. So what we did is we actually responded to the Women and Equalities Committee when they had a consultation over the summer about our key findings of these bound communities during this time and the disparities that they face and how badly they are impacted by the various factors, so health inequalities, deprivation, housing, occupation and then cultural barriers. Um, so in terms of health inequalities, I've just covered that. But deprivation, um, as some of you may be aware, a lot of the areas of high, low socioeconomic groups equally have a high population of people from buying communities. So that was another disparity that went against them in terms of the COVID situation. And then equally, we've got housing. A lot of people from certain cultural backgrounds live in multi-generational multi households, which aren't as typical for the white communities and there's also an increase of overcrowding particularly in areas where it's in low socioeconomic groups occupation so overrepresented again in the service industry hospitality the nhs passenger transport which of course we all know were key workers and are still key workers during this time but were also groups that were much more likely to come down with covid19 so it was another factor that was going against them Equally, we've got cultural barriers. So what we actually found when we were looking into doing this consultation is there was actually quite a lot of inconsistency in terms of um, translations available for guides. So in some guides, you'd find it in various different languages, whereas in another, it would be completely different languages again. Um, this inconsistency isn't going to be helpful for people that don't speak English as their first language or maybe can't read English. Um, but then equally, in other situations, these resources may have been made available as a physical copy, but due to everything that was going on, physical copies, there was little to no access of that. So we actually invited the Women and Equalities Committee to come through us and speak to the communities that we work with to actually find out about the lived experiences during COVID, because without consulting with these communities, I think we're never actually going to really know just how much of a psychological impact it has put on these communities as well as everything else i mean of course we've got the health inequalities that we're all very aware of we've also got the financial impact that we're all very aware of but the psychological impact on these communities who more than often know multiple people that have died from covid19 these are the exact sort of people you need to be speaking to to find out how we can hopefully prevent another instance where a big part of the bound community are suffering a, a lot more in terms of deaths and in terms of infection than in other parts of the country that are maybe less populated by people from the bound community. Um, so can we go into the next slide please? So something, something that's hopefully a bit more positive um, in February this year, we actually set up our associate membership scheme. So with the associate membership scheme, we actually wanted to align all the organisations that we work with under an umbrella and under the Sporting Equals name, really. Um, it's exclusive to community organisations, but that could be anything from a community interest organisation, a registered charity or even a small business. Um, but they have to specifically be either BAME led and by that we mean over 50% of people in leadership positions have to be black, Asian or minority ethnic or they need to have a majority of service users who are BAME as well. Um, in that time we've actually grown it to over 200 members and I believe that figure's actually slightly grown in terms of combined service users. I think we're getting closer to 200,000 which is absolutely huge really when you put it down onto paper. Um, what we do with them is at the moment we provide them with a monthly funding newsletter which is um, bespoke to the sector so anything from sports to education to being specifically for those who work within the BAME business sphere but equally at the moment we're actually looking at added value for these associate members so we're actually considering 
things like training opportunities um, for continued professional development. But then equally, hopefully, <laughs> when we're back into the swing of things, discounted events. And also we're making use of linking them into our research function. So getting our associate members involved with focus groups and other research that we're doing. Um, a lot of what associate membership has to do with is actually assistance with funding. So beginning with the Community Emergency Fund with Sport England earlier this year, we provided our associate members with like bespoke support in help for applying for these funding opportunities. Because what we found found before COVID was a lot of these smaller organisations, they didn't that they, they knew what they wanted to do as an organization but they didn't necessarily know how to go about bidding for this funding and we wanted to make associate membership about making sure that these organizations that have such a huge beneficial impact on the communities we work with had an easier access to funding and help them be able to get to that so we did that with the community emergency funding and then equally just this month we began fund distributing on behalf of our partners at Comic Relief, so that's across the UK, but then equally the Sport England Tackling Inequalities Fund um, in order to get this much needed funded across the country to the organisations that need it most. So for that, at the moment, we're currently doing bids for up to £10,000 per community organisation, um, and that is solicited at the moment to our associate members. Yep, that's me for that one. I think, I believe the next slide will be you, Abu. Brilliant. Hi everyone, uh, yeah, thanks for having me today. Uh, just to give you a brief update uh, on myself, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about myself or too many initiatives, but today I'm going to talk about Luton Sporting Club. But just to give you some context, um, I come from a very sports mad family. Uh, my grandfather arrived just after the war um, when he was in India and uh, worked in the docks in Liverpool and supported a team called Liverpool Football Club. Thank God, you know, it was, thank God it was Everton. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> just to uh, sort of let you know, so I got um, involved in football and sports at a very early age. So at the age of seven, uh, my dad moved to Luton uh, to work for Vauxhall Motors and we still followed Liverpool. My first football match uh, was Liverpool, I think back in 1982. And since the age of seven, I knew what I wanted to do and that was to play for Liverpool. So anyway, to uh, cut a long story short, you know, I uh, went through the academy systems, played at Luton Town, uh, Liverpool briefly, and didn't quite make it. So um, in Luton, um, in 1995, just um, when I started university, uh, I decided to set up um, Luton Sporting Club. Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, so Luton Sporting Club um, was set up in 1995, and the key reason behind because we had so many uh, young kids playing football. We must have had at least 300 uh, members in our youth club uh, playing football, you know, rugby, cricket, badminton, tennis, you know, really active. Uh, and one of the problems we had at the time was lack of facilities and actually access to sport. Um, our elderly sort of parents uh, didn't quite understand, you know, sports and how to actually get us involved. So hence the reason for setting up the Sporting Club. And the background really behind it is we came from a very diverse um, community in Bury Park, uh, predominantly um, Irish and South Asian, uh, South Asian meaning Indian, Bangladeshi and Pakistani. Uh, had a lot of challenges and the key challenges was uh, deprivation and poverty and high levels of crime, you know, a lot of gang violence, you know, in the early 80s. Um, so we thought, like, how do we, you know, tackle these issues? So the Luton Sporting Club was set up um, to actually tackle crime, health inequality, but also, you know, have a more cohesive society within our communities. And we started off initially um, trying to get a more BAME representation, you know, in sport, you know, entering football teams in leagues, you know, trying to get more people to play badminton, trying to play people cricket, you know, and entering in leagues. And for myself, obviously, you know, playing in academy football and we decided to set up a Asian league at the time, which was 1997, I think, uh, which ran for about 10 years, just focused on Asian communities who didn't have access to, you know, playing in league football. And, you know, just to give some background, we suffered a lot of racism at the time as well. So Luton was the hub of, um, 
you know, lastly, uh, the English Defence League, you know, we've had our, you know, fair share of uh, extremism. You know, we had the Al Mahajirin group, you know, young kids who actually were involved in our youth clubs, you know, you know, people who then went on to, you know, to join the extremist groups like Al Mahajirin and the EDL. And we've got a major, major problem here, you know, how do we tackle this? So we involved, you know, various partnerships, you know, the police, you know, the NHS, the local authority to tackle things collectively. And one of the key issues around, you know, funding at the time. So we developed a strategy, you know, with Luton Sporting Club, which was more of a commercial strategy for a grassroots sports club to actually get some funding in uh, to subsidise some of the fees to tackle, you know, some of the areas around the challenges that we faced, you know, hiring of facilities, you know, getting people more engaged. So we ended up having about 400 members, you know, young people from the age of like six onwards, right up to, you know, veterans, you know, from age 50 onwards. Um, and on this next slide, please, and I'll go into some of the um, sort of programmes that we had. Um, so initially we started off with um, football clubs. We developed probably about 70 plus teams in the Bedfordshire Leagues, you know, playing um, football on a regular basis. Uh, we, we needed qualified coaches from, you know, BAME backgrounds. And so we looked at funding to get BAME coaches qualified and we ended up with 100 qualified coaches um, to, to date. Uh, not just football, but, you know, cricket, we even had tennis. Uh, and we developed about over 500 plays over the years. And we needed support from, you know, various groups. And luckily, you know, we had sporting equals all the way along, you know, supporting us from the early stages, especially the last 10 years. Uh, so um, in the last few years, we, we set up a running club. You know, we got about 100 participants average every week, you know, aging, you know, ranging from 16 onwards, um, right up to, you know, 50. We even got 60, 70 year olds running on a regular basis. So uh, we decided to sort of um, in the last three years, uh, move that to just have over 50s fitness clubs uh, and having an average uh, attendance of 40 uh, participants each week. Uh, at the moment, some of it is being done online, some of it at local parks. And we started the cycling club, um, which we got about 30, you know, participants every week, regularly, you know, three, four times a week cycling, uh, also doing a lot of stuff for charitable courses as well. So um, on top of that, we got a lot of kids interested and not just kids, young people, old people, inter interested in careers in sport. And someone in my background, you know, obviously I've been fortunate enough, you know, to tackle um, a lot of issues around racism, but actually inequality within the game. So in... 2015 set up my own sports consultancy, been very successful, you know, you know, sitting in boardrooms, you know, working with the Premier League, with Liverpool, the FA and others. And since then, you know, it sort of gave us access um, to opportunities for other people, especially young people within our club, you know, to get mentoring, to get coaching um, on a regular basis. So, um, so in a sense, we decided to set up a forum with people with, exp with expertise in sports, but in business and in senior positions, uh, within sport and giving them mentoring on a regular basis. So the ICANN program, which is called, you know, it's every quarter, you know, we have mentors coming in and supporting young people with their career aspirations in sport as well. Uh, obviously, we've had our fair share of issues around um, crime, but um, one of the key things that we had was a taboo sub subject, especially in the Asian and um, black community, which is uh, around mental health. And we've had, you know, some suicidal rates, people from our club over the years which was quite shocking for us, you know, really, really caused a major impact in the community. And people just didn't want to talk about it. So we worked with a local organisation called Our Minds Matter, you know, to actually educate people around mental health and, uh, you know, shared a lot of knowledge. You know, we had sports tournaments, you know, various initiatives to actually engage people from um, the Asian community, especially, you know, to actually understand mental health and, and talk about it. So um, we recently started... Um, working with um, Our Minds Matter to set up something called um, Mental Health Ambassadors, but also um, people actually getting training around mental health, you know, and working with the community to actually support people. And uh, it's really, really worked successfully, and especially in the last six months, you know, around COVID issues, you know, people staying home. And one of the key things around young people, you know, who actually suffered. And back in July, you know, we were allowed back, you know, allowed to particip participate again uh, and face various challenges. So a bit about mental health. Um, then obviously we've got a lot of global outreach programs where we've actually engaged with various uh, partners, you know, um, around the world, you know, in uh, Ghana, in Bangladesh, in India, 
uh, the United States, Brazil, Argentina, various places, just, you know, sharing knowledge, learning from each other, you know, in terms of tackling poverty, you know, engaging in sports, and all of it done through sports. So, uh, next slide, please. So, so we obviously made a lot of you know progress in terms of overcoming barriers. So, to give you an example, Luton Sporting Club um, has a, a, around 600 members uh, from age five right onwards, right up to you know adults. And we're working with various communities. And one of the key successes is not just you know working with the BAME community; it's actually bringing other communities together. Uh, we've actually brought in communities within Bedfordshire who you know come from a very affluent area. And never actually engage with others from you know deprived backgrounds, and through the club we managed to actually overcome some of that, and also sort of tackle tackle some of the negative negativities you know around you know racism, but also understanding each other and you know people who were actually never engaging you know from different backgrounds. We managed to actually do that through football, through sports, and we got a very co cohesive community at the moment in Luton. You know, working together, tackling you know challenges together, which is really really important. So for us, you know, it's not just sports, it's more than a game, you know. And obviously the other issue around tackling around BAME engagement, trying to get more elderly people to get engaged in sports as well. And, and through that, you know, getting different skill levels, you know, different people from the community, we managed to engage, you know, the BAME community, which never actually would engage in sports, we actually participate in sports. Uh, around that, you know, we looked at how we access, you know, um, funding as well. You know, obviously a lot of it has been around, you know, some of the businesses who've been supporting us. Uh, we've been subsidising, you know, some of the fees, you know, some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, it's really been supportive, and you know, tackling deprivation through sport, you know, it's been crucial for us. You know, health inequality, obesity. You know, we've had all of these problems in our community. Now we're getting the knowledge by engaging a more diverse community within Luton to tackle all these issues. You know, not just around sport, but around everything else that comes with it. You know, health, you know, um, poverty, uh, and various other factors. Uh, next slide, please. So just recently, obviously, we've had a lot of issues around, you know, challenges around, you know, COVID-19, especially around the over 60s in our community, you know, staying home. So we started developing um, issues around, um, you know, online engagement, you know, over 50s, over 60s in our community really, really struggle, you know, to actually access online services. So, so we looked at a Zoom and de delivering, you know, fitness sessions and various sporting sessions online. So on a regular basis, on a regular daily basis, they're actually engaging actively, you know, in uh, on online fitness sessions, uh, which have been really, really successful. Um, obviously, there's around issues around socioeconomic factors. You know, we've had uh, in the last few months, you know, huge levels of unemployment increasing significantly in Luton. So which led to, you know, fees, which, you know, it's only, sub, you know, we paid about £150 a year for actually people to participate in our activities, you know, throughout the whole 12 months. And we really, really suffered, you know, the lack of funding from businesses, you know, you know, reduced by 50% in the last six months. So we faced various challenges. The availability of facilities within, you know, half the facilities in Luton are closed. Uh, we've had to sort of engage with private sector facilities where the prices have been extortionate. So we're really facing serious challenges at the moment and hopefully, we can ride that challenge and carry on and continue with the likes of you know support from Sport Equal, Sport England and others, hopefully in the future, and you know, tackle issues around mental health, you know, around obesity. So we, we are constantly engaging and hopefully um we can work with other partners. I mean, one of the successes with you know, you talked about um, earlier on, Nick and Emily around associate members within sporting equals. That was a major factor for us. We've managed to actually work with people from various parts of the country, actually looking at the challenges. We all face similar challenges. And we've been actually supporting each other, you know, sharing knowledge, you know, sharing information with each other, you know, to tackle some of the issues within our communities as well. So that's been really, really successful. Uh, at the same time, obviously, developing national partnerships with others as well, you know, learning from them as well, uh, you know, and that's, you know, engaging with others, you know, constantly throughout as well. Next slide, please. So obviously the future, at the moment for us as a sports club and as a community in Luton, the challenge is, is going through, you know, the current pandemic and how we're gonna actually get through that and survive, you know, and actively engage with our communities to deliver sport uh, continuously for the next 12 months. So uh, we've got a strong volunteer program, you know, 100% of our funding, you know, programs are run by volunteers. 
So we're looking at create, creating opportunities by working with mainstream organizations in terms of how we can support each other. Uh, in the very long term future, we've had a community asset based sports facility strategy where we got our own facilities, uh, uh, not having to rely on others. So um, that's that's a crucial part of our strategy. So if you can get that in the long term, um, then I think the longer term strategy is to leave a legacy where future generations actually can use these facilities and carry on the good work we're doing. So looking at that community based, you know, asset model, you know, is actually really, really crucial for us uh, in the future. But, you know, just to say, you know, everybody else throughout the country, you know, is suffering and hopefully we can work together to tackle all these issues. But to do that, we can't do it, do it alone. You know, we need support from, you know, the big organisations, you know, governing bodies, you know, from government, from local authorities, you know, from the police, from the NHS and everybody else working together. And our philosophy has been around working collaboratively, you know, engaging and you know, sharing this, you know, success as well together. So hopefully we can carry on doing that in the long term. Yeah, so I think, you know, that's all I can say, you know, obviously I would like to share a lot more, you know, obviously with the timescales and uh, hopefully, you know, please do contact me, you know, if you want to work with us or, you know, any questions later on. So thanks for that. Well, there we go. There's different ways of getting in touch with us, but um, yeah, and I'm sure through 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 um, through the team at uh, Active London London Sport as well. If, you know, do feel free to get in touch with us. One of the things we did want to mention as well, um, uh, and there's a chance to ask all of us some questions after this, but we wanted to mention that uh, uh, Emily mentioned the charter. We will, are looking at a, a follow up session, so we can it'd be great to tell uh, describe the charter in, in further more detail and i'm sure that can be arranged um with the team in london as well uh, for another another um online session uh, regarding this charter specifically thank you thank you everybody some amazing presentations and genuine food for thought uh, apologies i'm not able to share my camera so i am just going to be letters for this q a if that's okay so apologies for that um so as nick said this is now an opportunity for, for those in the audience to put any questions to our speakers and um, we'd really appreciate sort of your thoughts um we've got some great insight on this session so it'd be great uh, to put some of those questions to the speakers so yes please Please get those questions in and I will kick us off whilst our attendees uh, start to reflect on the, their own question. Um, a lot of the conversation there uh, around lived experience and I was just wondering if you think we place enough importance on that across society generally. We talk a lot about diversity and representation but that may be more demographic rather than lived experience. I was just wondering whether you think uh, we do enough uh, to place the importance on that in terms of representation of board decision makers or when making sort of investment decisions. I'll put that to you, Nick. Yes, no, thanks, thanks for that. I, I, I think um, what seems to be new about, I guess, uh, the policy landscape and or the sentiment from communities is that, um, you know, previous programs um haven't gone as far enough and really dealt with with the, with the issues of all the diversity of, eth of ethnic communities and there seems to be a bit of a societal shift in terms of saying actually what's happened hasn't been good enough and either you're as a as an organization that's trying to provide sport or physical activity is trying to do something for it or are you just adopting blanket approaches i think what seems to be a bit different this time is is that we're you know we're challenging organizations to say okay um you know you, you're putting statements out around that uh, around equality and diversity but what is the action plan that sits beneath that and that action plan has to be something quite tangible and real and so um you know i think the the, 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 the phrase lived experience is coming um in more into everyone's vocabulary and then i think uh, if you know policy makers be it those in the boardrooms in uh, senior, middle, all tiers of management uh, do come at uh, interventions based on communities 
lived experience, then there's a more chance of, 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 of real impact and where the communities will feel as if it's, it's, it's not tokenistic. It's something that's based on their, um, on them as, as individuals and communities. So, um, it's good to see that, uh, you know, there, there seems to be, um, um, an appetite to do something based on that. And it, and I, I know, um, you know, we, 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 our, our work around representation in the boardrooms and in the workforce is, is actually saying through diversity in those, in, 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 in those forums, in those boardrooms, you will have that, um, um, informed intervention. Mm. Um, and until you get that diversity, I mean, it's, in terms of gender, it, it's it's getting better, but still not good enough. But uh, it, it's um, it's still you know in terms of ethnic diversity, it, it, it could, there could there could be more, and um, and I think you know our challenge is very much you know on the back of Black Lives Matters, there there were lots of statements put out there, um, which was fine, which is great. It you know it shows commitment, but what's really important now is the action that sits underneath that. You know now is the time to be. For, for those organizations to be judged by the actions and and those actions have to you know um we're not talking about knee-jerk actions we're talking about long considered positive action interventions and and that's where that's where the charter charter emily was talking about it's got to be based on you know the capture phase for us it's about don't dive into your interventions find out make sure you've got the insight um uh, uh, in terms of internal organizational issues, but also your programs that are external as, uh, facing as well. So, so yeah, yeah, uh, uh, you know, well that that sort of gives some some answer to that. But uh, it, it's really, you know, uh, it, it really basing basing um, interventions on 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 people's um, real experiences as well is is that's what's going to make the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Abby, did you want to come in? Yeah, I was going to add to that. Obviously, I think the key thing, obviously, we've been working for the last 20, 30 years to sort of increase diversity within boardrooms, you know, within senior management roles within sport, you know, for example. But the problem that we've had is, you know, we've had a lot of strategies and policies come together. And most of it, I think people will feel have been tick, tick box exercises. So there hasn't been real outcomes. So I think what this does, we've got a great opportunity now to actually address the situation. And I think the last or well, next 12 months is absolutely crucial. You know, if organizations and governing bodies and even the government departments can show real tangible, you know, policies and strategic documents, which say, right, we're gonna actually recruit people. And no one's saying, look, you know, we talked about the Rooney Rule, for example, it's brilliant, yes, you get an interview, but what we're saying is, you know, we've got talented people out there, you know, talented business people, We've done really, really well, you know, to actually come into a boardroom and make that change. And especially football clubs, you know, the industry that I work in are really, really struggling financially. Now, when you got that diversity within your clubs, within the boardroom, it opens up a lot of avenues commercially. And, you know, I found that, you know, recently, you know, um, you know, access to funding, access to organizations where clubs would never have access to. And by having that diversity, they'll see the benefits commercially as well. And I think it's crucial that, you know, we've got some real outcomes coming out of these policies, you know, in the next 12 months. Otherwise, we'll still be talking about the same thing you know, 20 years on. And hopefully, you know, we can tackle it, you know, in, in the next 12 months. Yeah, absolutely. It's a little bit on recruitment there as well, Abu, in, in, in the, the sort of unconscious biases that may come in in terms of when organisations are recruiting. Um, Proud to say that London Sport has sort of led the industry in some of our work ar around that process. Uh, I suppose I'll take a step back and talk more more generally, if we can, and just ask what we would say would the first step that an organisation could take when it is looking to better engage with being groups, maybe as participants and in terms of the workforce. So I'll go to you first, Emily, please. So. I know we keep going on about it, but the Sporting Equals Charter, I did briefly mention that it's in two tiers. So in terms of organisations, we do a consultancy package, which we call our Action Plan Charter. And that's more project support, research, um, policy review, training. But at, a, at an entry level, we've actually created the entry level um, Sporting Equals Charter. So that can be anybody from a football club, um, to an active partner, to an NGB, to a charity, um, any sort of sports provider that wouldn't necessarily fit under the criteria of our associate members. 
um, and we actually give give that organization for a subscription fee of um, 350 pound a year access to our newsletter um which essentially means that doesn't mean you just receive our newsletter that means you have access to the content of our newsletter meaning that you can get messaging out to our very very diverse audience of people from within our sector and within this sphere that you probably wouldn't necessarily be able to reach um so for example We've got some smaller NGBs that have projects that they want to target specifically for BAME audiences. Um, we'll advertise that in our newsletter and we can also send e-alerts out to these people. Um, as we briefly mentioned earlier, that's a huge network of around 50,000 organisations and within that various different individuals. But then equally that will also, because I think you mentioned the workforce, that equally gives them unlimited access of vacancy support for the year. So we also send out an e-alert to our mailing list with the vacancies. Again, that's getting out to more diverse individuals than they probably would do usually. But equally, they sh we share that on our LinkedIn and on our Twitter as well. Um, so I think for me personally, from at my role and at Sporting Equals, I think if you want an accessible route to engage with these audiences that you're finding it um, not necessarily the most simplest route to engage with, um, just get in touch with us. We can look into how we could help you and hopefully we can put you in touch with our audiences to make sure that you're getting your messaging across to the right people. Yeah, absolutely. Nick, do you have anything to add to that from a sporting equals perspective? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. You know, we're, it, we certainly say the first route is 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 uh, as as an organisation, you know, make that uh, commitment to, to to engage. So what, So what I think has been happening quite often in the past is that when vacancies arise you know some some bodies who, who have got the resources will hire um you know a, bit of a recruitment agency and they will then get those in the information of opportunities out and it'll go through the same old network so what you end up is the same churn uh, so what what we're saying is get tap into diverse um diverse um uh, sort of mediums to try to get to that 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 uh, to that or to that to a diverse audience and uh so yeah certainly it's it's about saying right make that firm commitment to making sure all your opportunities are getting out there to as, as broad as um audience as possible uh, and the 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 more detailed work around um the action plan end is yeah that's where we certainly advocate for take that time out to do the the research collect what you've got in terms of um you know uh, your, your 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 insight developments and then base your uh, intervention and that intervention might be looking mm -hmm. at yourself as an organization internally or uh, and that might be you know where you say actually you know our, our, our organization's workforce could do with some um, training or some advice on on ethnic diversity and mm -hmm. uh, and then building on from that and so you're turning the dial and, and actually doing something um, rather than expecting sort of blanket programs to just magically engage lots of diverse communities it's about for us, it's that commitment to positive action, um, mm. and the charter is a route, is an example of a positive action intervention. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Abu, anything to add to that before I move to the next question? Uh, yeah, I mean, no, that's, that's fine. Actually, I think Nick's covered mm. most of it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, let's let's not start using the phrase "hard to reach" all those scrap it. We're just not good enough at reaching people. Exactly. Mm. Um, okay, I'll I'll move to the questions in the chat. Thank you so much for everybody. That, that has placed any in there. We have a question from Megan for you, Abu. Uh, what would you say was the toughest challenge COVID-19 presented you with? Um, uh, how did you overcome it? Yeah, so the toughest challenge I'd probably say was actually um, mental health around the young kids. So, you know, especially amongst our, you know, six to 14 year olds, you know, we, we didn't even realize, you know, kids were suffering. Uh, they stayed home, um, especially the ones who struggled sort of financially, you know, even just getting a, a meal, you know, they'd get a school meal, you know, school lunch uh, in the daytime. And mm -hmm. that was quite shocking for us and just engaging with various other organisations uh, to actually make sure they had food on the table. Um, and the other fact was, you know, they mingled with other kids, you know, whilst they were playing sports in the evenings and they weren't getting that for a long time. So our toughest challenge was actually... How can you actually engage with these young people, you know, during these tough times, during lockdown? Um, and we tried to sort of engage through Zoom and other sort of sessions that we had. 
And I think that was the toughest challenge. But I think the toughest challenge we're facing now is actually getting people out now. But the problem we're facing is the lack of facilities. Now, half our facilities are closed at the moment, some of the schools and the colleges. So we're having to hire you know, private sector facilities and we just can't afford it. And to continue that in the long run, I think is going to be the biggest challenge for us in the next few months, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Um, huge concerns around facilities and, as you say, income, uh, and also around the the food poverty. And it was quite hard for me to see and hear from some of the community organisations that have supported with that emergency response in some of the sessions earlier. Uh, okay, we have a, we have a question for the whole panel from Brian um, with the BLA movement and um, sort of high profile figures being more vocal. Um, you see the climate now as, as, as a moment in time uh, and as an opportunity to sort of create that positive change. And um, what do we need to see happen at a grassroots level to see these tangible changes? Uh, I'll go to Emily first, please. Um, I'll just speak quite quickly on this, but I think with um, Black Lives Matter coming back to fruition following um, George Floyd this summer, I think what we're actually finding is there's a lot more appetite from the sector to make some tangible change because I think it's kind of brought it to the forefront of the agenda. Um, and as quite rightly was identified, it, it is a great opportunity for positive change. But for us, it's all about keeping that momentum going. Um, we don't want it to just be a trend effectively. We want this to continue in terms of everyone being fully aware of disparities within our own sector, um, as well as the country and the world as a whole, really. Um, so it's all about, I mean, obviously we've been doing it for years. We've been doing doing it for nearly as long as I've been born as a charity. Um, but it's all about making sure that there's other people in the sector talking about it too. We don't want it to be something that's just a blip um, on the agenda. It needs to be something that's always considered and, we're actually hoping and from speaking to other people within the sector during this time, we can actually see that there's some tangible changes beginning to happen, but it's all about keeping that going and making sure that it's always something that's the forefront of people's thoughts and not just something that they'll think about, oh, maybe we need to engage more with BAME communities or maybe we need to do a BAME specific project. I think it needs to just always be something that's very pivotal and at the top of everyone's agenda really. Definitely, Nick. Yeah, uh, you know, echo that. I, I you know, we've made a, a a concerted effort to make sure, as as an organisation, we won't let it go off the agenda. We don't. Uh, I mean, one of the saddest, saddest, you know, it was uh, with with George Floyd's murder. You know, we 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 sort of reflected on 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 what 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 we've done as an organisation as well, and whilst we've um you know with all our work is naturally around race equality and being diverse and inclusion we've we've probably looked ourselves and said how do we make sure that the sports sector um in in two years time is still on it and and, and supporting this because the last thing we, we want to be talking about in five years time is still talking about systemic racism institutional racism in the sports sector you know um you know it, it, in terms of the way we see that that's about you know the sports organizations and all the issues and, and uh, surrounding systemic racism around um you know be it personal prejudices all the cultural factors around school and the media but also looking at organizations policies so all you know we need to look at it in the round and make sure that we are looking at all those areas otherwise we'll you know there's that danger of it, it going off the agenda so it's about it's um the policy landscape is there at the moment you know the societies will through um you know not looking for organizations sitting on the fence is 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 there at the moment and, and i think it's about um the sector as a whole um and following on from the statements that they've made and putting tangible actions and um and and specific uh, targets, act positive action around this. Otherwise, you know, it, it, you know, uh, it, there is that danger of it falling off the agenda. But as I say, it's about a, a, a organization saying, no, we, we are going to make sure we're turning the dial in the right way when it comes to this. And, um, you know, uh, I really think, uh, let's say we've seen, you know, Tim Hollingsworth has, has, um, has uh, listened to his webinar, Sport England, on their new strategy. 
they're talking about a 10-year strategy and tackling inequalities being at the heart of that and we'll be certainly um championing that and 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 pushing for that for that to make sure it, it features um uh, as part of the uh, uh, sport england strategy as well yeah it's a great point nick as and when black lives matter isn't maybe as high profile in the media and the next movement that comes along it's our duty i think as a sector mm. to make sure that people are following up on the work they're saying at the moment uh, and people are accountable for delivering against those things i think it's a really good point uh, abu do you have anything to add on that before we move on yeah just to add you know we should be just focus more on diversity so i know we're sort of really focusing around the black black lives matter campaign which is absolutely brilliant uh, but what we mustn't forget is over the years you know there's been specific focus you know being reactive to issues so you know let's be a bit more proactive and come out with you know just look at equality as a whole and not just specifically focusing on certain issues around whether it's you know getting more women into boardrooms or whether it's just looking at a uh, particular faith or whatever you know, it's got to be a bit more diverse so let's just get more you know ethnic diversity within boardrooms within clubs within coaching uh, just one thing to add, I, th I think we focus on specific areas. So I know in the last few years, when organisations looked at their strategies, more around coaching, uh, more around getting players involved. But what about the overall agenda around getting more people in leadership roles, you know, recruiting people in boardrooms, you know, just look at every single angle, not just one specific area. And I think that's got to be crucial, you know, when they make these changes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is almost the perfect segue so i thank you for that and so our next question from the chat from sam around we know that role models exist in the communities how do you think we can better support them to access those roles uh, in terms of on boards uh, and making decisions and especially those that maybe aren't as digitally aware or, or connected uh, as some others um emily Apologies, I'm muted myself, Ben. So you mentioned something about in terms of people that aren't as digitally connect, digitally connected. I think that's something that I also brought up earlier. Um, we've actually engaged with quite a lot of our members about the topic in terms of digital connection, because obviously we can't always presume that people are going to be able to even even for this event now that they're going to be able to attend digitally because it's just not always the case that people have access to the internet or access to software and especially in in the older generation and that disparity is actually more considerable amongst bank communities they're actually more likely to not be digitally literate than their white counterparts mm -hmm. um when we've been engaging with our communities about this i think a lot of it's been in the past necessarily word of mouth um going to faith centers advertising things within there but in the current com climate that's not always necessarily been an option um we've actually had some of our members that have gone and done work on doorsteps so talking back about our organizations even though a lot of them are predominantly sport and physical activity providers a lot of them have actually had to diversify over this time um just for the need of the community they've kind of become I mean, if they weren't already, they've kind of become pillars of the community and providing things like food. So, for example, what Abby was talking about in terms of people that were having school dinners at home, um, they've been providing food parcels, they've been delivering equipment so people can still be active at home. Um, they've just been doing a lot more things that they wouldn't necessarily have been doing prior to lockdown. But off the back of that, again, it's still been a case of, a lot of people aren't made aware of these things being available if it's only through an online medium so what we've actually found is it's been a case a lot of dropping flyers um through people's doors making the information disseminated through places like faith centers and community centers and really having to go back to basics in terms of communication without having the ability to speak to your clients not your clients sorry speak to the people within the community face to face um so really in terms of digital digital communication and any alternatives i think it's actually been quite difficult for a lot of our members um who haven't been able to diversify in this way especially if they're working predominantly with people over a certain age group from specific communities 
Yeah, thanks, Emily. It's, yeah, it's absolutely right. I think some of our, our speakers in tomorrow will be speaking about how they have engaged with communities sort of during lockdown, particularly some of those who maybe aren't as digitally literate, as you say. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I think that we'll draw the Q&A to a close there. Just before I close the session, I will just ask you all if you can just maybe give some closing remarks, maybe 30 seconds, just a, a takeaway for everybody listening as to what they can do uh, to sort of better increase representation in the sector or what one piece of uh, advice they can take away. So I will go to you, Nick, first. Um, I guess the, the, the biggest sort of, uh, takeaway I'd like to get across is, is um, really, you know, it, it, it's worth taking a look at what you, what you are currently doing and see what you can do better um, and not see, you know, we think, when it comes to um, ethnic equality and diversity, there's almost a bit of a, um, a sort of this is too, this is too much in the too difficult to do tray. You know that 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 mentality of that hard to reach mentality. I think it, the 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 psychology needs to be flipped and saying actually, this is something we want to make a difference. We will um, uh, do what's what is our positive action intervention that's going to do something and make it. Make it make it tangible, and uh, if, if 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 organizations want some support on how to do this, please please do get in touch with us, and we where we can help, we will. Where we can't, we will signpost you to somebody who we think can. So, uh, main takeaway is don't see it as in the too difficult to do tray. Commit to some positive action. What a brilliant piece of advice that is. I think in corporate speak, they call it grasping the net on it. Oh, doing the <laughs> difficult first rather than keep on putting it off and doing the easy jobs first absolutely uh abu yeah i think key thing is let's change our mindset um we are you know one country you know one community and that's the way we've got to look at it and i think together i think we can be successful and so let's not just you know differentiate you know people because of the color or the race or the religion you know we, we live in the same community same country and if we can all work together if we can respect each other and actually realize the potential that we can bring in the skills you know that we can bring in together collectively uh, we can do amazing things and I, th I think that's the key thing to look at it just change that mindset brilliant yeah emily i think for me if you want to have real actual change in making your area of sport and physical activity wholly more diverse you really need to make sure that you're speaking to these communities consulting with them um, gaining that insight to find out exactly where you're going right, where you're going wrong, or maybe what you could do to change their experience of sport and physical activity and make it a more positive one. Again, if you want any help in how to go about doing that, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us. Yeah, definitely. And as Nick said earlier, we will be looking to host a session in the near yeah. future on, on, on the charter. So for those for those in attendance just keep an eye on sort of our newsletters website social media for any information on that um i think that there's no better place to, to stop than there there's some pretty inspiring closing remarks so thank you so much for that and thank you for your attendance and sort of sharing your insight and knowledge with us today uh, also thanks to those in attendance for your patience um apologies for the technical issues we had earlier and the delays in getting started um, before I do close, if I could just ask for those in attendance, if you could please complete the survey that we posted in the chat. Um, your feedback is genuinely very useful for us in sort of designing future events and um, making sure that they're as useful as possible for you. Um, I would say as well, there are some more sessions taking place today uh, focused on uh, children and young people, which is a theme that's come through throughout today and yesterday. Uh, so exploring the impacts of adult behaviour on children uh, and the youth panel where we're actually hearing uh, from young people uh, rather than uh, reflecting our own assumptions onto their lived experience. So uh, yeah, I'll wrap up there. And again, apologies for those technical issues. Thanks again to our speakers and for those in attendance. And hopefully we'll see you at another Active London session soon. Thank you and goodbye. Lovely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.